Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Man, I tell you, uh, Emery, when I grow up, I'm going to be just like you. I'm going to set this over here. Can you all hear me? All right. I hope you have thoroughly enjoyed uh, you Sunday. Uh, I did throw my students a curveball. Uh, this morning, I had them, that ones that taught Sunday school this morning, I had them teaching out of Revelation chapter 2, uh, the church of Ephesus. And uh, I will give a round of applause to Eli Szynski and Connor Swanson because they took the uh, senior adult class upstairs and they were talking about losing sight of your first love. So uh, kudos to you guys uh, as well. Uh, But anyway, uh, if you have a Bible, I'm going to ask that you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 22. And I've actually, the biggest mistake I've made is sitting on this passage for about a month and a half. Um, I've told some people, as I've seen uh, in in coming and in passing, that uh, it allows God to show you how much is off in your life, but it also allows Satan to throw things to kick you uh, in the gut or throw you off in your walk with the Lord. Um, But this has been a passage that's constantly stood out to me. Um, It's constantly come up in conversations with various people, and it's kind of been the groundwork that I've had uh, for the students in a way, and I know they're going to be reluctant to hear what I have to say because we talk about it all the time. But Matthew chapter 22, before we get there, uh, by way of introduction, love, right? We use that word a lot. I love you. I love your shirt. I love uh, your, your color of your hair or whatever you want to say. Many of you remember uh, the good old song from the Beatles, All You Need Is Love. And then a little while later, we had a guy by the name of Lionel Richie wrote, Hello, is it me you're looking for? I can see it in your eyes. I can see it in your smile. You're all I've ever wanted and my arms are open wide. Because you know just what to say and you know just what to do. And I want to tell you so much. I love you. Or how about this one? Romeo, save me. I've been feeling so alone. I keep waiting for you, but you never come. Is this in my head? I don't know what to think. He knelt to the ground and pulled out a ring and said, marry me, Juliet. You'll never have to be alone. I love you. And that's all I really know. I talked to your dad. Go pick up a white dress. It's a love story, baby. Just say... Yes. In case you don't know that, that's Taylor Swift. (laughs) But on the other end of the spectrum, right, we also sing songs like How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Or maybe you remember this one, Love is a Verb by a band by the name of DC Talk. Or how about Crowder? God really loves us. We say we love a lot of things. Chocolate cake, ice cream, people, and music. But the question I submit to you this morning is not whether you love those things, it's whether or not you love God. So as a framework or title of introduction, I've I've titled this, Our Goal and Our Purpose. And here's the reason why, and this is where I've been sitting practically since I've got here. I truly believe that in order for you to live a purpose-driven life, you first have to not only know God, but you also have to love Him. Something very hard to do. Something not easily to understand. So if you're there, Matthew chapter 22, and I'm going to ask that if you're willing and able, would you stand in honor of the reverence of reading of God's Word? This is Matthew chapter 22, and I am reading from the English Standard Version. Picking up in verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Verse 39 and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 40. And on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. That is God's word for us today. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that right now that I would be the Stradivarius in the hands of the maestro, that my words would be your words. This is not about me. 
But we've come here this morning to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Lord, we do have things on our hearts. We do have things on our minds. So many temptations. God, may we just set those aside just for a moment to come and worship You. We love You and we thank You. In Your Son's precious, holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So, in case you're wondering what kind of preacher I am, uh, I've always done the best to my ability to exposit God's Word, meaning I'm going to take you by the hand this morning, and my, my goal, my purpose for us this morning is to drag you through from verse 36 all the way down to verse 40. That's where we're going to stay. That's not, we're not going to go through the rest of the book of Matthew. I heard Mary Carnes was cooking, so I'm going to try to get us out of here as quickly as possible. But before we dive into verse 36, it is only appropriate that I give you context of what, how we got to where we, where we are. This is Matthew's gospel. Matthew was a tax collector. This is his eyewitness account of the 33 years of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Now, in case you don't know, Jesus spent 30 years preparing for three years of ministry. That's somewhere I don't want to be. But the reality is, as we pick up in Matthew chapter 22, uh, starting in verse 15, he starts talk, talking with the Pharisees about how there's a separation between the church and the state. And then we get down to verse 23, and uh, the Sadducees have a very unique way of asking him about the resurrection. And ultimately, he kind of blows their mind, if you will, and uh, then we pick up in verse 34, and ultimately we know, uh, too, as well, uh, from the Sadducees, they, did, they didn't even believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. Um, Amen, brother. <laughs> be sad, too. Verse 34, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. So before we even get started, we already kind of know from history that the Sadducees ultimately did not believe in the resurrection account of Jesus Christ. But what is a Pharisee? A Pharisee was a person very legalistic. They were required to know the Torah. In case you don't know what the Torah is, that's the first five books of the Bible. That's what we call the Mosaic Law. They were required at the, by the age of 15 to 16 years old to memorize the first five books, not like the first five verses, the first five books. And the Pharisees hear that he had shut down the Sadducees and, and then they kind of huddled up. They start planning. Verse 35, and one of them, a lawyer, asked them a question to test him. Before we even go any further, most of us, you know, have an idea or per perceived idea of what a lawyer is. Some of y'all in this room, you think of a lawyer, you think of the show Suits, or you think of Ally McBeal, or you think of some guy in a briefcase in a suit and tie. Some of you may think of Daniel Davenport. <laughs> That's not the lawyer we're referring to. This is, a very, this is a man similar to a guy by the name of Ezra in the Old Testament uh, who is skilled in the law of Moses. They memorized the first five books. So this is probably the guy that knows the most in the crowd. And he comes to him, verse 36, and he says, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? The funny thing is, is he's asking the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, a question that this man knows the answer to. But notice what was at the end of verse 35. He asked a question to test him. So obviously we know this lawyer is not the sharpest tool in the shed. You're going to ask the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the super heavyweight champion of the world, a question to test him. And he says, what is the greatest commandment in the law? That's like me stepping out back with Michael Jordan playing a game of horse and expecting to win. It's like me hopping in a pool with Michael Phelps 
expected to win. Verse 37, and this is where we're going to camp out for a while. And he said to him, this is Jesus' response, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That word love there literally means to long for. Some of you spouses in here, now notice I said some of you, some of you, when your spouse goes on a, a business trip or some kind of trip, or maybe they go out with their friends for the day, some of you long for their return. Some of you. <laughs> but the question this morning is, is, do you long to sit at the feet of Jesus? Are you Mary or are you Martha? Because I feel like so many times, even in my life included, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest, and, and as a friend of mine said a couple, several weeks ago, uh, just, just hang with me as you eavesdrop in the conversation as I preach to myself, because that's really what this verse has done to me. But that word literally means to long for Him. And we come from verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This brings us to the first truth of the text this morning, and that truly is the fact that we must love God with our entire being. With all that we got, with all the gas in the tank, with everything that we own, we must love God. We have no other option. This is not, uh, you have the option really to be disobedient or obedient, but are you going to put God first? But let's dissect what he said. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Let's start with the soul. The soul is very important because it's the innermost being of who we are. It has two destinations, heaven and hell, and it's your choice of where you spend eternity. Or how about the mind? Let me ask you a very personal question. Do you take your thoughts captive? Because it doesn't matter who I do it to, or even if I did it to myself, if I were to connect your brain to this projector and every thought that you ever had was put on this screen, buddy, I'd be the Tupelo, Mississippi, as quick as I could. But that's why Paul writes in the New Testament, take your mind captive. Hey, you're not loving God when you sit there and have an angry thought about your spouse, your children, or that annoying coworker you work with. But notice the one I skipped. The heart. The heart is the core center of the body. It's where your emotions, your thoughts, your feelings originate. But it also is what should belong to Jesus. When Jesus responds, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is a cross reference to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, where he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. So apparently this lawyer that comes to test Jesus doesn't think Jesus knows the Old Testament. And yet, from Genesis 1, to the end of Revelation, it's all about Him. I heard a preacher say this the other day, uh, and I, I didn't really think about it, and then I started, I've been reading Revelation in my quiet time, and then I really realized how true it was. The beginning of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, we get kicked out of the garden. The rest of the books in, in between Genesis and Revelation is how we get back. But the heart is very important. Here's why. Who or what occupies the throne of your heart? Because as I'm a student pastor to these students, I see it all the time as they come in. Whether it's telephone, whether it's drama, whether it's school, whatever it is, I can tell that there is something else sometimes in their life and even in my life that is not Jesus occupying the throne of our hearts. Let's go down a list. Is it materialistic possessions? He doesn't say you shall love the Lord your God with everything that you own. Is it fame? 
Several years ago, I stepped foot through the gates of an Ivy League institution known as Troop McConnell University. <laughs> Y'all laugh. That's my stomping grounds. <laughs> Freshman year of college, I'm sitting there and a guy asked me, what do you want to do with your major? My major uh, was Christian Studies, Concentration in Theology. And I laughed. I kind of just chuckled, smiled at him, but didn't even back down at all. And I said, I'm going to be the next Billy Graham. But the reason behind it was selfish. Why did I want to be the next Billy Graham? Because I wanted my name to be written down in the history books. I wanted my name to be known across students and Baptist history alike, to be written down as the greatest evangelist that there ever was. Hey, can I tell you something? Six feet of dirt makes all men equal. And the reality is, is a lot of people today don't even have a clue who he was. There's a reason that the book called Purpose Driven Life begins with the phrase, it's not about you. There's a reason I have a sign in my office that says it's not about you. Is it sports? Don't get me wrong. I love to watch the dogs play. I wish the Braves were in the World Series. But if that's occupying the throne room of my heart, there's something drastically off in my life. How about this one? And before you get your, your torches and your pitchforks, hold on. Is it hunting? You laugh. I've hunted the most in my entire life this season. Uh, I've, uh, I've shot one, killed it, never found the corpse. Uh, the other one is to be determined. I still haven't figured that out yet. So here we are. But the reality is, is I'm not going to let that stand in front of my walk with the Lord. And as out of order as a lot of things could potentially be in my life, I know where I have to go. And that's the Bible. And you may say, Aaron, these things are a lit, uh, uh, seem kind of targeted. Yeah, well. Oh, well. Because it goes back to something Dr. Adrian Rogers once said. Whoever you love more than God, that's your idol. Whatever you love more than God, that's your idol. So I ask this question again. Who or what occupies the throne room of your heart? Because I'm here to really entrust and guard the souls that I've been entrusted with. Why? Because I want to make sure that it is Jesus Christ only and Jesus Christ always. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And that's the only way that equation works. Anytime somebody says Jesus plus, it better be nothing coming after it or else that's a false gospel. But if there's any set of verses that are cross-referenced this morning that are going to step on my feet just as much as it is yours, it's Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. For am I now seeking the favor of man or of God? For if I'm still trying to please man, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. It is so easy to be a people pleaser. Me and Scotty have had this conversation a lot. Tim Dempsey looked at me last night. We had the fundraiser for Mountain Fellowship, and he's over here digging ice. I don't know who said it, but somebody said, hey, quiet down. I'm like, quiet down? The ice maker's outside the kitchen. You can't quiet down. Am I seeking to please man or please God? 2 Corinthians 5, 9. Am I, whether I'm home or away, May I seek first to please God. And this is all things that I've really just been learning across the last several months is, is who do I seek to please? Is it myself? Is it others? Or is it God? Because true joy only comes when you seek to first to please Jesus, others, then yourself. But continue, as we continue in verse 37... Notice what's not in the text. You can learn a lot about what's not in the Bible. 
He doesn't say you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Or he, sa he says that. He doesn't say you shall uh, work, love your God with worry, stress, fear, people pleasing. He doesn't say all that. So why do we do it? Well, we're sinful and ignorant. Yep, that's, that sums it up. So we know that we're commanded to please Jesus and to love him. But the question remains is, OK, well, how do we do that? Well, let's look at it like a rifle scope. Let's let's broaden our horizons. Let's zoom back out for a second. Matthew chapter seven ends with a parable or a story of two people, a wise builder and a foolish builder. Both hear the word of God, both face the storms of life. Yet one decides to obey God, builds his house on a rock, his storm stands, or his house stands. The other guy builds his house in the sand. He builds it in the dirt. Rains came down, streams rose, the winds blew. What happened? His house, his house collapsed. We have to be obedient to his word. We have to have that time with him. Me and Tommy and Jerry and Scotty, Misty and Kari have all talked about this as a staff. But there's, there's moments where even all of us at own staff struggle to get in the word. Man, you look at, you know, I talked about time management when I was in the interview process. And then Scotty showed me his calendar and then I started praying for him because I just realized how much stuff was on your calendar. It was insane. And you wake up some mornings and you're like, from the moment I wake up to the moment I'm trying to put my head down, my, my, my schedule is filled. But how is your time with the Lord? Are you at least making an effort to get in His Word, to chew the cud? Or is your only time in God's Word when you come into this room on Sunday mornings? in which I say you're spiritually malnourished. When I was in the interview process, I came and then I turned around and went back to Memphis for two days and then came back for the, like a whole week, which was pretty interesting. It's like the fastest I've ever been to Memphis uh, and back. But uh, I was reading a book, and I still have it. It's that book right there. It's called Purpose Driven Life. If you've never read Purpose Driven Life or you haven't read it in a while, go pick it back up. It's really good. And I'm sitting uh, there, and I'm, I'm kind of going ahead and saying my goodbyes to the students that I was heavily invested in uh, while I was there. And um, I get to this, this chapter where he talks about your achievements and your, uh, your goals. And Rick Warren paints a picture that I'll never forget. There was a guy many years ago who played, he loved to play tennis in high school. So in high school, he's playing tennis. And then all of a sudden, he, uh, he gets accepted to college on a tennis scholarship. And he wanted to be the, the collegiate state tennis champion. That was one of his top goals. And he ends up winning. Several years go on and he has a business, he's running his business and he walks out to the mailbox one day and there's a package sitting at his mailbox. And in the box, he opens it up and most of y'all know where I'm going with this. He opens it up and there it is. It's his old state tennis trophy. Notice what it was in was in a box. We'll come back to that in a second. There was a note attached from the school that he used to attend and it said, we found this next to the trash can because the school is currently under remodeling. And Rick Warren would go on to say, your life achievements, your life goals do not matter because no one cares. And which I'll never forget as I was discussing what I was reading with the guy sitting across from me. He says, that sounds a lot like a song by Casting Crowns. And I said, really? 
Which one? And he said, only Jesus. And I, I began to, I looked it up, I began to play it, and as, as he continues to go on, I realized I had heard the tune. But that day was the first day I heard the words. I, I, I don't want to leave a legacy. I don't want them to remember me, but only Jesus. Notice what Jesus says in verse 38. He says, this is the great and first commandment. So what Jesus has now done is he's now summarized the first five commandments of the Old Testament. Right? Love God. Don't have any other idols. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Okay. Now we go into verse 39. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Some translations read, you shall love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. It's from this one particular verse that we see that it is from our love of Christ that we effectively love those around us. Jesus, others than yourself. But a question arises here in this passage that we must really kind of dissect. And some of y'all, y'all, y'all might laugh at this and that's OK. Who's your neighbor? Some of you are like, Aaron, I live at the top of the hill. I got to drive all the way to the bottom just to see somebody. Well, if you're married in this room, your closest neighbor is your spouse. If you're a parent in this room and have kids at your house. It's your spouse and then your, then your family. Then from there, it's the person to the left, to the right, across the street. And if you still don't have nobody after that, it's the person that hands you your coffee every Wednesday morning or uh, that you work with. But you shall love your neighbor as much as yourself. You want to know who I struggle to love? My own family. Yeah, I had a professor in college that used to say it this way. The best way to sanctify people is put them all in a room together. <laughs> Mom, Dad, I'm sorry. Because I've been living a life that's been self-centered, self-focused. And when you look at God's word, what does God's word say? Philippians chapter 2, consider others better than yourself. What does he say otherwise? He says, consider not only your own interest, but look not only to your own interest, but look to the interest of others. Do everything without complaining and arguing. Hey, by the way, that's all found in Philippians chapter 2. But here's the reality. We must realize that we fulfill the great commission by doing the great commandment. There are only two greats. Hey, when I came here, I established the, the groundwork for the student ministry. It's love God, love his word, love the lost and love his church. That's it. You want to sum up a ministry? They need to be doing those things. Loving God, loving his word, loving the lost and loving his church. That's what ministry is all about. And yet we do that by spending time in his word, obeying his word and living for him. Notice what he says in verse 40. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Excuse me while I have a very nerdy moment. The first five books of the Old Testament or what I call the Hebrew Bible is called the Torah. That's the Hebrew word for law. It's the first five books. Genesis. To, you get the picture. OK. Then, as I, I will mention, the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament is actually divided up into three books itself. The first one we already talked about is the Torah. The second part is called the Netuvim, which is, means the prophets. Right. That's like Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, the book of the twelve, which is basically all the prophets besides Malachi that everybody doesn't name their children after. Amos, Obadiah, Haggai, Zechariah, Zephaniah. Jonah, Micah, Nahum. I, yeah, I mean, uh, that's about it. That's the prophets. 
And then you have the ketuvim, which is called the Hebrew word for writings. Why do I tell you all of this? Because look at what he says in verse 40. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. You want to know what the first two thirds of the Old Testament is about? Love God and love people. That's all it is. But yet, our sinfulness gets in the way. But why do we love God? It's because He first loved us. Here's the reality. You ready? He bled and He died for all of us. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that whoever shall believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Some of us in, this in here this morning, our life is so flipped upside down because everything's out of order. Some of us even though our life is out of order, we still have that relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And what He wants you to do this morning is He wants you to come and He wants you to get your life back in order. But notice what I said. The only way to have a purpose-driven life is to know Him and then to love Him. Some of us, our life is out of order because we don't even know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We're created beings. Our purpose in life is to know the Creator. That's it. So where are you at this morning? Do you know Him? Are you trusting in Him? Are you kind of like me? Trusting in your own ability to do things? Leaning on your own understanding like Proverbs tells us not to do? Are you actually walking the walk and obeying His Word. So as we respond this morning, I'm not going to ask you to respond. I'm going to beg you. I'm going to beg you. Whether it's in your pew, whether it's up front, maybe you need to talk to somebody. I'm here. Scotty's here. Al's here. Our deacons are here. But what is God asking you to do? We pray with Him. Lord, I ask that even in my own life uh, you've, that you would make changes. But Lord, we know that your word never returns void. We, we know that you are high and exalted. We know that you are God who sent your son to die on the cross for our sins, not his own. And Lord, may we put our, our, our faith and trust in that this morning, that that it is finished. The work on the cross is done. Lord, we love you. Move in this place this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, Pastor Scotty Gerard here, and I just wanted to say thank you for joining us today. We really hope that this has been a resource that's helped you grow in your purpose for God, but also grow in His glory. We also want to extend an invitation to you to join us here in person at Harmony Grove. We are located at 1008 Town Creek School Road in Blairsville, Georgia. We would love for you to come be a part of our service, to be a part of our small groups. If you have children, we have children's classes on Wednesday night and on Sunday morning. And all this information can be found on our website. We'd also like to continue help you in your growth with Christ. If you have a question, maybe a prayer request, or just need to talk to somebody, you can contact us in the emails below in the description, or you can also contact us through our app and through our website, which are also found in the description below. Again, we hope this has been a blessing to you because we know that you joining us today has been a great blessing to us. Thank you so much. God bless.